Hi, hi everybody, welcome. Uh, small group, but that's good. Better a small motivated audience than a large audience with unmotivated people. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, if there would be people uh, here that helped organizing this event, I want to um, say thank you to them to, for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> I came from Belgium with the, with the train, so it took me about 13 hours, but I, I uh, finally got here, so that's the good news. So I'm a Belgian designer and an, an artist. Um, I did numerous jobs as an artist and as a designer, and I obviously have an interest in the future, otherwise they wouldn't have invited me here. And um, since the last 10 years, I focused on how would our future, how could our future evolve towards a, a solar punk society. Um, and one of my main interests is nature, and especially how we can learn from nature, so that's called biomimicry. Um, and of course also technology and science, they're all part of uh, the vision that I uh, and others depict. So, though I know that many people will already have um, attended to other uh, speakers at this event that talked about solar punk, so I ought to uh, expect that everybody has some vision about what solar punk is all about. I uh, showed here two illustrations. That those are the only two, uh, two illustrations that aren't my own illustrations. And they show uh, other punk art genres. One is um, steampunk and the other one is uh, obviously uh, cyberpunk. And it's all about uh, creating a world. So that's what those art movements do. And typically uh, what's often depicted is the city. And in cyberpunk what you see here is a rather dystopian worldview where much, much, uh, many computers, artificial intelligence, robots, stuff like that, and often an anti-hero, that's the, the punk concept. And the steampunk is more classical, the Vic Victorian age, and what they, the central question here is, how would the world look like if it's steam-powered, obviously? So both, as you can see, are part of um, the one, that one of Judge Dredd is, one, it's a movie, and secondly, it's also um, a comic book. And the other one, uh, Arcane, is a game and a um, animation series that you can see on Netflix. So you see there's this um, <coughs> influence among artists and among the movie industry and um, <coughs> game designers. So that's also very interesting, that there's a large scope of people interested in these genres. And I think with solar punk, the, the scope of people interested is even broader. And um, th that's because we envision here uh, a bright, uh, sustainable future that concerns all of us. So that's the first of my, one of my own illustrations. So if I would talk about solar punk, I would divide the word solar punk out of the two words solar and punk. And I think solar, everybody has an idea what solar means and what it stands for. Uh, obviously, it stands for the, the how would a solar world look like, a solar-powered world look like. But we will not limit us only to the uh, solar-powered uh, energy, but also other renewable energies are welcome, of course. That's why I also added an arrow to the windmill, very well-known uh, uh, energy source, wind, and to the ship as well, the sailing ship. Uh, because it doesn't stop at just the energy production. We also uh, look at how uh, the means of transportation, agriculture, architecture, they're all important here and, and they need to be shown in a, a future uh, solar punk, a futurist world. But the punk element, that, that's a very important one as well. And with and many solar punk visions that I see depicted on the internet, you, uh, the, the punk element is a little bit missing, but it's, I think, perhaps even more important than the solar part. And uh, that's obviously about um, having control about the means of production, about agriculture, food, food sovereignty, food security, energy security, and who needs to have control? The people who live at those specific places. They need to be, become more, de more independent um, because now um, we all depend too much on large corporations and uh, state-controlled services that not always serve the interests of the mass. Uh, you all know that in capitalism there are other um, things that matter for those in control, uh, the profits and the financial returns. Uh, 
I should have added the photograph uh, that, I, that inspired me here. This is actually where I live, uh, in Ghent. If you would come to Belgium, I would invite you to visit that city. It's a nice medieval city, you won't regret, regret it. Um, and it's uh, an, a more industrial side of Ghent. You probably won't see that one, but I pass the, with my bike often. And in and, and the front, what you, would see, what you see here is actually barren land. You, typically see that at more industrial sites where you have a lot of infrastructure, roads, canals that, need, that are used to, for logistics to deliver, the, to supply the goods to the um, factories and the industries. And that land can be used and managed in a much better way. And here it's about permaculture practice, practices and you see some low-tech uh, cable system that's used by local people just who live there. And, have more control in this way uh, about the food, local food system. In the back, I also added an arrow with the, what, what, what's the, the punk side, and what does that mean, the, uh, this punk image? It's about, um, off, those are office towers, corporate office towers. We built a lot of commercial uh, buildings and corporate buildings, and also not in the most efficiently used way. And we still have this um, conception about um, land and real estate where we have privately owned buildings that um, slow us down in, in creating a real uh, collectively uh, managed society where we use the space much cleverly. But you will see that in the other um, slides as well. So <coughs> this slide, I showed, I showed it to just to, um, to say one small thing. I can predict the future, nobody can. We can only give some hints and show images uh, how we would like that fu the future to be. Um, and there are many other visions as well. That's, I can assume that people are, that are here already are fond for some more solar punk visions. But it depends a little bit of your personal situation. The class you're in, if you uh, need, need to struggle for the point where you're at in that life, or if you are wealthy, uh, your culture, the background, uh, your re religious background, the geographical situation, if you're living in Africa and in, in a more des des uh, desert situation where climate change uh, smacks hard, that will be diff different than if you're in a northern country. Um, so you see, so you see different situations here. Perhaps I won't, won't explain them all to, uh, so we can move on to the, the core of this presentation. But I once did an exercise uh, with some befriended science fiction writers uh, to summarize different other uh, uh, visions about a future. And there are plenty, and those are some. You can see the first one is a, a typical eco-village. You have m many people who are sick of society as it is today, and they just want to get out. They want to stop at the rat race. They seek for land, which is needed if you want to start something. And they find land, often think about countries like Portugal, where the land is rather cheap, with villages that are completely uh, deserted. And they go there and they start their community. It's a bit solar punk, but still, uh, it's quite uh, an isolationist uh, community as well. The other one is a more typical high-tech city. So that's what corporations like to promote. Um, technology will uh, deliver us all the solutions and they want to move on. It's business as usual from a uh, capitalist society and, and a neoliberal uh, regulation towards a more greener uh, variation. But the power dynamics remain the same. That, so that I wouldn't say that that's uh, really solar punk as well. Perhaps some people will be more uh, focused on religion and more spiritual uh, visions. That can be a, a future scenario for some communities. This is for the billionaires in, in the audience. Perhaps there are some who, um, who are interested in this one. And there are obviously a lot of billionaires who are already thinking about their grand utopian ideas that they can finance with <coughs> their, um, their wealth and often uh, very uh, exclusive, only for those who possess enough. And well, they can keep continue to do this as long as, they, uh, as the cash comes in. Uh, more a plutocracy, or even an, uh, an, um, an, uh, where there's um, yeah, a plutocracy or, or, or one ruler who, 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 has it, who has the power here. And I think we already have many examples in the world where there is a small group of one ruler um, 
a dictatorship. That's what I was searching. Uh, has yeah has control about the country, often backed up by uh, military and police. Uh, so it's difficult to go towards a solar open community as well here, because it's likely that you will be arrested when it goes too big. So uh, this is a, a slum village. Um, we already well known with slums, but perhaps in the future, uh, new, new slum cities will arise. Think about the many climate refugees that are coming to uh, Europe, and we push them back. And what we, we create temporary, uh, for instance, container refugee camps, but after a while they become permanent. And it could be that it evolves towards a situation where the dominant powers uh, take, make a line and say, okay, you do whatever you want, and if you cross this border, we shoot. So they are left on their own. That's a more unintentional community, of course. Perhaps some solar panel elements could emerge there, but uh, then you have, of course, futurist visions that have always been there. Think about living on the open sea. The open sea, that's rather difficult, but perhaps shallow waters or lakes are possible, and so some will be focusing on such visions as well can be a little bit solar punk as well, it depends. Uh, some still believe in technology, uh, even when it comes to their, their own personal belief. Think about transhumanism. So they, these are supposed to be tra a new tribe of transhuman people who with their adaptions can survive in, in more hostile environments. And what you see here is something very present day, um, a fandom. You can see many people who feel much more uh, attracted towards fictional characters and imaginary culture and feel um, that they relate more to, to that than to the real world. And already it's manifesting in uh, events and in fairs, but perhaps in the future some communities could gather and start their own uh, imaginary culture uh, community. So just to say there are many visions in a complex world and solar punk is uh, part of it. So uh, I will focus today on mainly on the city. I have added some slides about um, eco-villages as well, but I don't know if I will get there. Um, we'll see. I have one hour and a half, so we'll see where, where we get. Um, you see how uh, the, the city evolves from uh, a very dense patchwork of infrastructure and, and towns. And this, I obviously added this uh, map of Europe and I think everybody will have the same impression. It's, of course, a little bit exaggerated, but I needed this illustration to show you once we introduced the car, and once we invented the car, we got the freedom, but we unfortunately also got uh, to, to make roads and infrastructure to go wherever we want to go. And this created this immense patchwork where nature doesn't have much place anymore. And in um, a, a future, a nearby future, we will one of the key solutions of um, climate change adaption will be that we need to um, go for um, enormous uh, rewild rewilding uh, efforts. So this, the city is still a very good environment if we manage and design it intentionally uh, instead of very cha chaotically and um, non-intended. And if we get rid of the property rules and regulation as we know them, we could create very uh, great sustainable cities and it could become something like this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I made this uh, transition. This is a part of a, a, ser a series of illustrations that show you how uh, we could evolve from where we are now towards a, a, a late solar punk future. Um, it's just to give you an idea what it um, could be and what different stages we, we could um, and uh, we could have. So the first one is the now. It's not if we walk out of this uh, building that we will see such things. It's more metaphorically. It's, it's symbolizing um, what we see today. We're in a situation that in, in, a, in, a, in our current civilization is very polarized. Um, so we have the old system and many people perhaps feeling so much, even political leaders and corporate leaders, feeling so much anxiety that they still support the old uh, recipes um, that de don't deliver anymore the solutions that we need. And at the other hand, uh, there are small scale initiatives uh, happening, like you see this rooftop garden, you see people here who um, get rid of the pavement and started to grow 
uh, I don't know, some uh, trees or perhaps gardens. You see uh, tent camps here, but you see also uprisings. Uh, that's because also the public is very, very polarized. If you would compare it with the story of an apple, and in our current situation, you have, I don't know, corporations who sell you an apple and say, okay, uh, to one person you have an apple, we give you this apple, but if another person uh, comes and say, let's do something different and get rid of the apple, we will uh, grow some apple trees and you will have a diversity and abundance of apples. Many people are rather inclined to still protect their apple and they don't see uh, the future to come and they are, are um, easily uh, you can easily set them up against each other, and that's what's happening in this uh, day and age as well, that demagogues and political leaders use it to seize power in a very um, disrupted, polarized world. Uh, and this one is obviously um, yeah, somebody who doesn't see any solutions anymore. But So you see also the drone, that's about, about state control and about more uh, repression, because when the mass becomes more... Um, uh, yeah, once you uprise, you need to repress it if you want to keep control. So after a while, uh, the grip of uh, corpor uh, the corpor corporations and the, the state loosens, and we end up in a situation where the, where they're still perhaps they are still dominant, but it's less uh, less than it used to be. Um, but we we are we have an economic fallout where the. The, the, tr the global trade system as we know it doesn't exist anymore and it's more difficult to have those huge uh, urban construction projects as we knew it. So what need, do people need to do? They need to, it's, it's the age of do it yourself, do it ourselves. Um, typical Jugat uh, solutions where you see all those quirky des designs and solar panels popping up everywhere, where you see rooftop gardens, all good initiatives, you see people reclaiming the streets, so the car is obsolete here. But it's a situation where it's still um, too little organized. So uh, there needs to be more organization, but that comes in a, late, oh, in a later stage. So already here you have regional cooperatives. Communities uh, on a local level start to cooperate with each other and they start to create energy, large regional energy cooperatives. Uh, cooperatives to, um, to deal with water management issues and stuff like that. Even old futurist ideas revive. Uh, you see the buildings that we know, like office buildings, skyscrapers, are being retrofitted. And uh, this is, for instance, the Kikutake, uh, I don't know if you know him, a futurist from the past, uh, idea of capsule homes that's been integrated in the city. And you see there's much more green as well. Even water ponds, water gets its place in the, in the city of tomorrow as well. Uh, things evolve and become more and more organized, but we have to deal if we, you see in the back, the city is much more surrounded by wilderness and the brown supposed to be uh, agriculture, sustainable agriculture practices. But the city evolves and we will have to deal with the demographic expansion as well. So more and more people come to the city, so you have to have uh, an idea and a plan how can we evolve uh, smartly. The city has become a superstructure, but we will see um, other illustrations as well in, in the later slides and it becomes more an, of an integrated superstructure that is in service for the people. And what you see is uh, the city expands along transit lines. So you create, after a while, an urban map of towns and villages that are connected, but where you have much more space, freestanding houses and freestanding infrastructure gets demolished, and uh, you connect in, uh, cities and, and, um, and the place in between is also part of the city and we call it the linear city. That's uh, how it's dubbed. What you also see is that there is an, an introduction of even some high tech, like uh, personal package transport systems that use guidance, guided rails uh, to deliver packages because you need other uh, solutions as well if you uh, abandon the car, of course. That is what I would call, in Belgium, there's a famous uh, architect and futurist called Luc Schuiten, who makes these beautiful illustrations and artwork. He's quite old, but he, he has a long career um, with many beautiful depictions of uh, what I would also call solar punk cities. And you see the city has almost become one with nature itself. Um, 
And you, what you see here is a, a nice example of a contour trust city um, with the many like rice, pla rice field platforms. So it expands the, the surfaces that we have to grow veggies and to grow uh, plants. Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, this is an era in which we finally find new um, materials because that, that is obviously one of the problems we have. We uh, depend too much on, on concrete, which has a, a carbon positive outcome, but we need carbon neutral uh, materials, even carbon negative materials, so materials that sequester carbon. And uh, one of the ideas that is being used here, if I could redo this illustration, the brownish structures that look very organic, I would draw them thinner, more like a, a parametric design, computational design, with tensile structures, stuff like that. But anyway, um, it, it's shown here because there's a revival of a new um, abundance of a new material that makes it possible to, um, to create large new uh, uh, urban expansion. And this material is, uh, originates from um, sea cultivated organisms uh, like algae, uh, diatoms, uh, bacteria that we add with uh, seashells. That's just one idea and it makes it possible to create this carbon, carbon negative material. Uh, we come to the final, uh, the final stage of a solar punk future in which yet a new, the advent of a new material. And this is, um, for this material, we just need to look at um, biology, at nature again. So we have basically three ways of producing humans. Uh, we have subtractive uh, processes in which we subtract materials from a large piece of material. We have additive uh, fabrication where we add material, think about 3D printing, and then we combine them. That's called assembly. But there's a fourth mode of uh, f fabrication. That's how nature works. If you put simply look at the seed and you put it in the ground, it grows from that one seed an entire tree. And if you look at a mammal cell, for instance, and it grows um, uh, a whale or a gorilla or a human, very complex uh, beings. And uh, our, our um, living habitat could evolve from an artificial living cell as well. If you look at how nature does it, you have this cellular organism that, is, um, that uses a membrane to protect it against a, a rather hostile and, uh, outer environment. And it uses osmosis to uh, um, let the materials infiltrate and inside the cell happens a form of production. It breaks down the materials it needs and it uses it for its organelles and for its uh, cellular uh, reproduction. And when the cells reproduce, it can uh, flow the materials it needs through a vascular system. And it can grow in very complex uh, forms. And this uh, city that you see is actually a living symbiote. So an artificial uh, living city that constantly senses its environment. And we have evolved towards a society that's not, no longer human-centered, but is actually centered for all species in the entire world. It's typically for our present-day um, society that is very, very uh, human-centered. And we just build and do things without taking into account that there are other species that use the soil, use the air, and use the land. Uh, so, uh, what are the different aspects that are needed? This is part of um, a book that I'm working on together with a Canadian writer, and that's obviously urban rewilding. So it's not only rewilding of um, uh, what used to be th that patchwork with, with uh, lots of infrastructure, it's also where cities need to be rewilded. They need to be more pleasant to be there. It needs to be, if you walk out your door, you, 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 you wouldn't see concrete and steel everywhere and cars. Uh, you should, should end up in a street where, where you feel like you're in nature already. And, uh, of course, in the beginning you see typical historical buildings. That's uh, Fredericton in Canada, for those who may know it. It's a, a rather older colonial uh, architectural style uh, village town. But we could sacrifice some of our buildings, some of our infrastructure and create passages for, for instance, wildlife, and that's what you see here in the foreground. You see uh, lots of trees and you see mammals that have uh, access and we, uh, we preserve this area only for wildlife. So we no longer think that we are the superior species uh, and we think, yeah, we, we put the city here, we can't redo it or undo it. 
but we can uh, make it possible by sacrifice some of our infrastructure that need, uh, animals can pass, and that's what you see here. There's more place for public transport, you can see that as well, um, and for um, much more open space, public transport and uh, pedestrians and bicycles. It can start small, so uh, if you would look at anybody who owns a home, um, the, the right illustration shows even a typical uh, urban home with a small garden with lots, lots of shadow. But you can start there uh, by using climbers, for instance, and making biodiverse systems that welcome many other species as well, so that many other uh, species can live in a biodiverse uh, street or neighborhood. The other one is something that we are already doing. At the, at the left, we are more and more uh, making our cities uh, more better suited for water infiltration, but we again look at it from a very human-centered uh, focus. Um, we could look at it from a more care position, where we take care for other species, and I uh, deliberately chose the, the earthworm, a very um, humble species, but I can assume that uh, if you could ask an earthworm what he would like or what it would like, it wouldn't choose to have concrete and steel everywhere. It would choose, probably choose to have um, access to, um, to soil and so it could go to the surface and could uh, recycle organic matter that falls on the ground and it could aerate our soil and I think, uh, or soil. I think if we would have a philosophy where we take care for other species as well, many of the problems that we're facing will be solved as well. So uh, I would promote um, a civilization of care. Um, this shows one of the problems that we, we have with our um, use of land, a very large problem in our, our cities today. And actually, uh, the key problem here is that and on top you see Obviously, the problem is that animals can't pass. And if you look where the people in such a large space actually have access to, it's a very small uh, strip of, of um, uh, sidewalks that they can use. Most of it is uh, preserved for the car. And all the other red buildings are privately owned. So we, we take that for granted. But actually, um, it's not that land was divided uh, and pieces that one would once be... Um, uh, for humans, so it, we, we created this, we created those regulations and we created those models of land and uh, uh, real estate ownership. And it gives us many problems like um, speculation, uh, people like having a situation where one single person could theoretically buy up an entire street and he can decide what he does with it. If he says it's lucrative for me to, to have parkings, we have to park all those electric cars somewhere and he can gain money with it, he can choose for it, but he, um, he, he, s he slows down uh, the creation of um, a real solar punk sustainable future. Because if you look at uh, the other illustration, you could move towards other models, so like George's uh, uh, approach, um, community land trust approach, models where we still could have our privacy, where you still could raise your kids and have a minimum of privacy, where you still could have your own garden, but where we look more from a perspective of a collective, more from a perspective of a community, and uh, for other species as well. So part of the gardens and the need is um, made clear so animals can pass and people can pass as well. You have a much greener environment that's much more healthier, and we still could define rules uh, for people to have their own small, uh, small piece where they can uh, live privately with their family. But um, the ownership models definitely need, need to change uh, over time. Um, what you see here is uh, another aspect. It's, um, it's about um, retrofitting our infrastructure. So, very typical uh, about or um, current civilization is that we have very a lot of commercial uh, buildings and commercial towers in our cities that take quite a lot of place and obviously they are, they are mostly situated in the, the, the center of the cities but they are completely underused and misused and mismanaged. Uh, Everybody knows those uh, pictures where you have homeless people sleeping next to buildings that are uh, are empty during the weekends, such 
things are very uh, well known. And uh, when, once we get rid of this quite arbitrary uh, um, the, the division of public space, private space, and we drink, try to think more collectively, we can build superstructures and we can build structures that um, serve the people living in such places. And we can define well, the functions of buildings much uh, more clearer. Um, and in the beginning, this is a more typical early age solar punk illustration, where you see uh, again those quirky designs because there's a yeah there there's, there aren't much large uh, construction companies and there's a lack of materials, so we need to upcycle, recycle the materials that we have, and you what you get is uh, a vision where people retrofit the existing buildings, and they can already do quite nice things. What you see is that there's a, a cycling path at the first or second level, so you could actually um, preserve a certain level and create different layers of transportation uh, passages throughout the city and wind space. Uh, we could redesign rooftop, uh, rooftops and make, make them more suited for uh, rooftop gardens. We can have adapted, more parasitic uh, types of architecture that blend in with the existing towers. Um, all such things and, of course, again, urban rewilding. And you see what used to be a typical corporate lawn in, uh, in front of uh, a typical corporate or commercial office has become a much more biodiverse uh, example. Oh. Um, so here you see the same building, but in, in a different setting. There's actually w w the, the illustration that um, the photograph that inspired me here was from a, a Canadian city. It's called Halifax, and it's a, a typical harbour city where you have those typical concrete harbour and those lar large piers with a lot of yachts and beautiful boats. But again, a, a very human-centered uh, view. There used to be a river system that shaped that river over ages. Then we came and we um, yeah, created at our, our convenience for only for our needs. But we could uh, regenerate those uh, harbors and create an environment that's much more uh, welcoming for other species as well. You see the seal who uses a pier. So that these are simple solutions, but it just um, needs to be taken into account by the designers and by urban planners, architects. Uh, of course, obviously, uh, other means of transportation over water, like sailing ships, survive. You see that the pine trees can get much closer to the, the, the shoreline. And you see those retrofitted, retrofitted structures. Some perhaps could be stripped and used as greenhouses. Others could become housing towers. Perhaps yet others to, to uh, take care for elderly people or the, the, the young, young kids. Um, and you still see quite a lot of natural materials in the beginning, many natural organic materials, materials that you can produce locally, uh, will um, emerge and will be used. That's another example. Uh, it gives a view on a, a city centre. And you see that it doesn't need to be uh, always quirky or uh, jugat style. It can also be you can also use digital fabrication methods, like on top you see a 3D printed facade that is neo-Gothic style. So we can be very creative whatever we whatever we do. It doesn't mean that we need to go entirely back to a low-tech civilization as well. Of course, low-tech can uh, be introduced and is welcome. Uh, but what you see in the middle there is that uh, vertical, my pointer doesn't work anymore, so uh, it's the shaft is an elevated shaft, so high-tech can uh, still be integrated as well. You see that streets that were one, once uh, very uh, dominated by the car are reclaimed by the public and reused by the public. So it's a much more healthier, inviting place to be. And what you see here, and that's actually the focus of this illustration, is a, a, a town hall. A typical town hall, supposed to be the center of the democracy, um, <clears throat> and supposed to be the place where people could go to and discuss uh, things that concern them about their local community, about the place where they live. But in the end, I don't think that many people end up in uh, the town hall to discuss uh, certain matters. But this is an, another design that 
it's much more inviting with community tables, with community kitchens, where people just want to gather and where they come by accident. Because around this uh, city center, there are workshops, a grocery store, coffee uh, shop, where people can drink a coffee and um, eat something. And they meet, her, meet here by accident and they could easily uh, chip in and listen to one of the presentations that somebody have, somebody who wants to pitch an idea for the neighborhood. It's much more, a much more inviting uh, settlement. And, uh, uh, and on top, you could have working, uh, open work, uh, co-work places where people could collaboratively work on community projects uh, and uh, find the proper expertise and proper people to, to work out different uh, things in different uh, fields. The small, uh, tiny house-like uh, rooms that you see could be uh, focused on specific uh, specializations. It could be healthcare, it could be sports, it could be uh, water systems in the city where you could go to and you need more technical expertise where, with somebody who guides you, a technical expert. You, you will still need uh, people doing administration and people uh, guiding you, but it's again a more uh, a different concept. So we could reinvent many of the services and um, things that we have in this present day uh, society that is entirely shaped by the system we, we're in. So um, that's uh, nice. Uh, oh, yeah, back. Um, so another aspect is uh, retrofitting, but in the beginning, we could also try to cleverly use uh, the chaotic cities that we have, where cities are always built on the remains of a, pres uh, a former city, and many cities are, have a, a long history, and we preserve and keep our uh, relics of the past, which is, of course, a, a good thing as well, but it makes it also difficult um, to do a, a, an urban expansion so we could use the space that we have more cleverly by adapting, uh, by introducing uh, forms of uh, more parasitic architecture. This is a, a concept derived from um, a Finnish architect, Marco Casagrande, and he um, showed a nice concept of the parasity, where he uses some sort of generic rectangular shape that can be easily used and fit in in between, for instance, two buildings that can cross streets and where you can create in an organic way some sort of superstructure. So that's what you see here. You see bridges that connect formerly uh, privately owned buildings and all of a sudden we expand uh, or the, the, the spaces that we can use in those cities. And many of those volumes, um, we could think about systems that are like a little bit like the legal technics concept that can be uh, attached to each other and can be much more cleverly used uh, to create more space. And you see as well that the structures, again, the red, uh, I would point to it, uh, red robotic structures that use the rails from those uh, rectangular structures are used here to deliver packages, for instance. And what's also, um, what I also want to point out is the Asian-inspired style of dividing places. So we could also move towards a more minimalistic lifestyle where we uh, use our interior space much cleverly. So we don't need to produce as much as we produce now. Um, also an introduction of in the middle of uh, some sort of artificial waterfall. So we again uh, welcome water in the city. In the past we uh, put the water away under the ground or we regulated it and made it straight so it passed the city very quickly. But we let the water meandering through the city and uh, regenerate water systems. So this uh, bio-urban organism, if you would look at the city, you see the first illustration. That's a typical urban uh, uh, blueprint with large buildings, infrastructure, roads uh, meant for the car canals. And uh, those buildings, if you were to strip them down, what you would see is, not always, but in general, you would see the, the, the typical Le Corbusier domino concept of uh, different levels. Uh, divided by roof plates and uh, uh, ground plates and load-bearing columns and you could pass from level to level with an elevator or a stairs. So imagine if you 
would stop looking at the city at this building is owned by this person, this building is owned by that person, that piece of vacant land will be used to build that commercial building. No, if you would look at it from the point of view of um, an entire community who could use that space, you see actually superstructures structure, that can be used and combined to generate a superstructure. And um, you would have lots of those skeleton buildings that can be used with uh, a new form of adaptive, adaptive architectural modeler uh, uh, generic designs. So we could uh, go towards those illustrations that you can see at the right and colored in the red. And then you get an, ent an entire new uh, um, concept about what a city might or could be and you win space as well. So what you see in the lowest il illustration that perhaps some uh, levels could be entirely used uh, by uh, vehicles that can, small vehicles, electric vehicles or uh, bicycles, that yeah, could be a possibility. Uh, and it does need to be, of course, as uh, complicated or as such a grand idea, it doesn't need to be like that, it can be start small. The first illustration shows, again, an, an Asian-inspired design where you just have two buildings, one street, one public street, and two buildings, perhaps all both privately owned, perhaps two people who, um, who want to move for forward and have a vision about a future, and uh, combine them or connect them with the help of the municipality uh, to create this Japanese or Asian-like uh, uh, wooden bridge. And it adds a new element in, on your, uh, in your neighborhood. This is actually a design that, that exists where people can also meet, have another view on the city where they can add green, uh, like climbing plants, and you can imagine it yourself, I assume. The other one is also a very simple one with Inali, that now in a normal present day you will find plenty of such examples if you walk in the city here, where heat, especially on a warm day like this, reflects and um, it's absorbed by the concrete and you get in, into a, a really a lethal situation where, where the city becomes a heat island. But we, you could, uh, if you think more structural and more from, a, from out of the perspective of creating, uh, going, uh, having an entire different vision about how you use space, you could uh, connect two buildings and create those shade uh, green roof uh, shady places. That can be again used for communities as well, to play some chess or whatever. Uh, another example where an entire street is regenerated with a smaller place for a new line of uh, human powered and smaller electric vehicles and where you have those terraced structures um, that also so, uh, solve the, the problem of uh, the sunlight in the summers. The same goes up for uh, a lot of the vacant space that we will have in obsolete uh, office buildings and corporate campuses. You could, there are enormous, um, uh, there's an enormous amount of uh, machine constructional uh, systems that can be easily clicked and combined with each other to very fastly uh, create shapes in a room that can serve a multi multitude of uh, functions. So we could uh, have this very um, flexible, um, resilient way at, at looking at the space that we win. Um, and even, yeah, you could even, in, at a certain point in, in time, you could even say, oh, city will be part of a, a larger bioregion. We already passed the time where we arbitrarily divided our land in the, in the borders of what we call nations and countries. But we look at how nature, how a logical nature, natural system uh, works. And so we have a bioregion, the city fits in in this bioregion. And we could, for instance, turn our cities into a, like this is some sort of valley like city. That's, of course, a very exaggerated um, example, but it, it becomes possible. The other illustration shows what uh, f two former uh, office towers uh, have been turned in into. Like you see that there are passages from one building to another building and you hardly can recognize that it once were two, for instance, very well-known commercial uh, shopping malls. But here it uh, can have a multitude of uses. Uh, we could uh, house people and do m so many things with it. And there are many other functions as well. Um, like I said, it can be used for personal package uh, transport as well. 
that's what you see at the left. Um, okay, next slide. So after a while there will become more uh, new forms of architecture as well. We could use this generic uh, models that are logically and easy to produce locally. So we don't need to have uh, production that comes from there, another part of the production that comes from there, where that it can produce locals on the spot where you live. And we could change our, uh, how, our look on how we look at uh, our cities and think about uh, ecosystems, seeing uh, the human as yet another animal, like there are so many animals, and try to um, uh, think from an ecosystem design philosophy where if you would add a, look at a, a forest ecosystem, a tree is an ecosystem on itself, and the many trees combined form a forest. That's, of course, a, one large ecosystem. A city could become something, uh, something similar, where you have the offices, new, uh, new towers, I mean, that become ecosystems on themselves, similar like a tree, and combined they form a large urban habitat ecosystem. And if you would look at a tree, what you see, the canopy with its uh, amount, a large amount of leaves, what they do, they catch the sunlight, use it for their own photosynthesis, and use it to, um, for their own chemical pr processes inside the leaves. Uh, or buildings could do the same. They capture the water, they ev evaporate water. Or buildings could do the same. They could have green roofs, and what you see, the brown uh, top layer, is an infiltration uh, volume where that infiltrates the water and uh, makes it pure again. And water goes down and comes into a pond. A pond where, uh, where that can be used by many other species as well. That's something that you don't see that much in the city, but we could redesign our buildings in, in cities in this way. Uh, on the bottom, where the tree normally does, it grows its roots and the roots uh, penetrate the soil and they extract uh, their materials out of out of the soil and there's a constant recycling happening in the soil we could do that here as well a building could become a recycling center so the, the products that we used we have quite some plastic that we uh, produced could be um, uh, collected here and what you see underneath is an open source um, uh, half fabricate production center and all those open source hardware uh, plastic machinery it exists think about the precious plastic project perhaps you know it uh, you can easily download the plants and make one of those shredders or extruders yourself and you could start with a local production and those designs can be used to create recycled benches from plastic and stuff like that those are initiatives that are already happening but could um, be integrated in a new community vision that serves local communities and on-the-spot production. You see uh, the second floor here is used for a family that can use it for uh, a leisure and for uh, relaxing for some cooking, but there's also a public uh, um, place where, where, with a public kitchen underneath. And on the top, uh, I actually made this illustration for a book that was about uh, the future of work. And this is an, an entire vi a new vision about work, where we go to uh, corporate uh, campuses and where we work from nine to five. Uh, a lot of what, what David Graeber said, bullshit jobs, but here we have an entire new concept about work where, uh, where, where we could chip in in some community task or needs uh, that a, or uh, community needs. And we have artificial intelligence, we have uh, the internet to organize ourselves, and we have uh, artificial intelligence that can help, help us with um, guiding us what tasks that need to be done more quickly instead of other tasks, and they can help us with assembling teams. And you can go here freely, and uh, the myth that people will not be motivated anymore if there aren't a, a large group of corporations that provide them a wage, that's a, yeah, a real myth. Um, people would see that we will still produce and create the things that we need and have plenty of free time as, as well. So people come here, it's like a co-working space, and um, on a community level they can organize work over here. You see that buildings are connected, and a, and a forest as well, the same thing. 
A forest is not a standalone uh, organism. It's connected with the entire forest. If you would look at the soil, you would see that there's a mycorrhizal um, and, uh, network of fungi, fungus that uh, connects all the roots with each other. And here the buildings are connected as well. So this entire new vision um, becomes part of uh, our solar punk future. You see how we uh, move on towards the contour terrace c city, because the city obviously will expand. People will come, on, come and come, and we will have to deal with the population growth as well. And what you could do is um, move towards the borders of the city and grow horizontally like a mold does. You could look again to nature, and molds grow horizontally as well. Um, we could use the same uh, building systems to grow what we called the contour terrace city. At the borders of, of the city, uh, large uh, contour terrace structures are designed that can be used for a multitude of functions. And here you see some depictions uh, of what it could become. Um, and this is uh, an illustration I made for a, a Czech architecture magazine once. Uh, and it depicts several stages of this contour terrace city. In the, in the center, you see the large skyscrapers, typical for an industrial age uh, architecture. And you see the red uh, connected um, volumes that could be more of the solar punk age, where we uh, use the space more cleverly and where we uh, abandon the concept of private ownership, but we think more from a community perspective and transfer land and real estate to the commons. And uh, what you see is at the borders, you get those terrace-shaped uh, volumes that can expand horizontally as well. And that can be used, it can be used for um, agriculture or for parks or for uh, um, small vegetable gardens for the, for the people from the city. And immediately next to the um, contour terrace cities, you see that uh, all sorts of uh, sustainable agricultural practices happening. And then it becomes food forests, and that goes over into wilderness. So we could end up in a situation where everybody can literally take his bicycle, and within five, 50 minutes they are in, or 20 minutes they are in, in the complete wilderness. Um, you see how we uh, revived the river system as well. We even created the, the brown that you can see is an artificial uh, canyon-like, valley-like structure that we recreated uh, to welcome many species that we once uh, destroyed by regulating that river. Um, and what you see is in the back, you see another knot, another uh, note of this, um, I mean, uh, of this urban web connected by a linear city, where, where the city can expand as well. And uh, around the city, complete vast wilderness. We gave that space back uh, to nature. Um, yeah, how, would it look, how could it look from the outside? So here you see people that are in the food forest picking uh, food, and it's another myth that is caused by um, the agriculture uh, multinational industry that we would have no food if they uh, uh, aren't in charge anymore. Well, that's a myth I recommend you to look at, for instance, Joe Vlaat and his uh, uh, food forest and permaculture videos to see the richness of a, a food forest system. And people could just enjoy uh, the feeling of going to, to, to grab their own food. And you see there's, again, a rich diversity of many other animals as well, grazing animals, birds of prey, stuff like that. You see gardens, uh, water elements. And uh, we depicted here a typical madrasa-like architectural style to show um, now we see a uh, cultural uh, influx of people as, um, as a threat, a threat in our civilization, but it doesn't need to be a threat. It can be an enrichment, of course. Um, it could be, uh, we could create this nice mixed part of art architectural styles with, that come from all over the world. And uh, here you see the more typical Arabic style with a um, uh, Persian style mixed with uh, a solar punk style. And the forms that you see are, are the contour terraces and in the back you see a city. Um, again, uh, how you look at a city, I would say you look at it as 
and to the contour city as well as an ecosystem. You see the coral ecosystem uh, that has its different layers of coral systems that all are combined and connected with each other and serve a multitude of species. Starfish, angelfish, you see uh, some of them summed up there. And you have the uh, terrace contour city as well. That is uh, a multitude of uh, smaller ecosystems, sub-ecosystems as well. You have natural forests, forest, you have grasslands, and you have uh, an artificially created meandering river system. And um, so that, that merges perfectly with the, the surrounding nature. We let water aqu aquifers fill itself and uh, it can be used for all uh, aquatic and all animals instead of only for agriculture or for industrial uh, uses. What you see is that the cities in those uh, lower uh, levels of that Contutera city can be used for agricultural practices. So it can be used to store goods, it can be used for housing, townhouses can be used for uh, to store or agricultural machines and devices and again those agriculture devices can be easily open source as well think about uh, uh, open source ecology that devised uh, a great deal of um, machinery in a completely open source uh, manner and again you could with the community uh, take the con control about means of production and means of uh, your agriculture organization and that's what you see in the top uh, part of uh, the contour trust layer. The inside, with a much more uh, space that is used by um, open public space instead of cars, parking lots. And what you see here is that people gather, yet you have an increase of social space where people meet, greet, uh, exchange ideas. And that's, I think, obviously uh, what you see in this picture. You have colonnades and passages that where people can walk in the shade with much more green and plants that, uh, that carry fruits that they can pick. And again, and, uh, some sort of um, Roman-inspired aqueduct-like system. So the water is present again as well. And in the background, the terrace, the contour terraces of that city. So expanding, as I said, uh, can be done by using uh, the linear city. What could be an ob uh, obvious approach is um, that it expands along a transit line. That can be, a, for instance, um, a rail system, uh, an old rail system, rails, and, um, or an old road that has been used. And you see that it has the same architectural shape as the contour terrace uh, structures. Um, people can live there and can, can have the same conveniences, same, same services if they live uh, there as well. So, how would it look? Um, oh. Here you see yeah, how, it could be, how cities could be constructed. That, that is as well the Contutra city as linear city by building up these la layered uh, structures. There you see the, the upper right illustration shows the contour trust uh, structure, but it doesn't need to be one single uh, vast network of a, a superstructure like um, architecture. It can be uh, dispersed with, with uh, open space in between. And this is a more late solar punk era uh, linear city where you actually have, uh, so um, thinking ab again about the um, nanotechnology, artificial uh, growing city that can, could even make it possible to grow uh, underground cities quite easily. But we're speaking about that's speculation. We're speaking about a, uh, a distant future here, and the terraces could shape and blend in more easily and become more naturally uh, with the surrounding nature. A winter scene of such a linear city, you see how it's much more in harmony with its surroundings. And, and the top spaces are here used to grow green, uh, to, to, for greenhouses. So you could use, again, your space much, much more cleverly. And uh, people will always nearby uh, all the services they need when they live in this linear city. Such linear city could, could have all sorts of shapes. I'm presenting here the typical contour terrace, but it can be whatever. This is, uh, this is inspired by some sort of organic uh, growth pattern of a, 
uh, plant, the, the first one. Uh, it can be a large, at some places broad, where it could be thin and almost unpopulated as well, actually becoming just a, a railway system, not more or less than that. And it can be a, a very dense populated uh, area as well. It depends what we want and where we at and wh what uh, the, the communities that live there want to do with it. You see the typical uh, eco bridges. So again, now we make infrastructure and we hardly think about animals that need to pass there. So again, a very human-centered uh, way of looking at or design and building and constructional uh, techniques. But in a new vision, we will always think, what will we do with land uh, that um, make it more difficult for other species and how can we uh, and do that, what can we do for other animals as well? So these eco-bridges can be part of it. We could even uh, use this, so such superstructure, a linear city, to regenerate uh, land that we uh, completely uh, wasted um, during the industrial age, former mining sites or sites that we polluted, by using the linear structure as some sort of valley. That's what you will also see in, uh, in many of Luc Schuyt and his uh, visions. And the linear city, as I said, can be thin, it can be a very broad structure, and it moves, meanders along the, the, the world, um, like a river system, for instance. And it could go underground, like tunnels. Think about tunnel networks in, for instance, Norway or Swiss, Switzerland. Um, it can cross uh, rivers, like bridges do. So we could easily uh, find our way in uh, the landscape without disrupting it too much. Uh, like we have in our patchwork uh, urban uh, dispersed society in the present day. Uh, just some view about a cross section about how such a city could look like. And you actually have everything there. You could have regions where there's more heavy industries, where it's less uh, interesting to live because that makes noise and all the annoyance that you would have. You see number two, heliostats to uh, add natural light in the structure. Uh, number three, show uh, residential zones. It can assimilate old architecture as well. And even number 12, fancy uh, science fiction like uh, technological projects like the uh, Star Trek uh, turbo lift could be reintroduced in such structures as well. And number 11 is also a little bit of a high-tech virtual reality, augmented reality uh, project where we could use inner spaces to even uh, mimic uh, a, another city, an old, an old Parisian look uh, or even an ancient city. Uh, we, have, we have the technology to create such uh, nice environments as well. Um, the concept of, of work evolves as well. In uh, late solar punk age, we could operate machines. We don't need to uh, sit in the devices and come in unhealthy, uh, dangerous situations. We could uh, use it, the telework uh, concept uh, to use augmented reality, virtual reality to um, operate uh, robotic systems from a distance, that's what you see. And the, the advantage would be that if people get out of their workplace, immediately they are in, surrounded by a, a beautiful nature. It's, I think it's a lie that people need to watch out on a, on a wall. Um, we could, there's plenty enough space. Uh, another concept, but it depends on your imagination, is this is a shake, it's from the Jap Japanese, and it's, a, it's called borrowed scene where they constantly work with the landscape and use it uh, within, their, um, within, within their houses as well. We could use this in the linear city or in the contour terrace city as well. Um, and here you see we could even use the terraces and the surrounding environment to grow uh, specific plants like, I think about hemp, rice, uh, pine trees, uh, aspen trees. Um, that can be used uh, to make organic materials. So, uh, and we could use them, high-tech um, high 
architectural fabric from an organic from organic matter, uh, plate material, pressed plate material, um, hall fabricates to construct uh, furniture and stuff like that, and can be grown uh, because we will need space as well. Uh, oh, that went very quick. I don't know what happened here. Oh, so. Um, the linear city, yeah, that was last. Yeah. Another advantage is if you would look at space and you see it as um, a generic volume that can be used by people, we could look at it entirely differently. We could say we generate or we create a space that serves us in our basic needs. It keeps us uh, away from the hot environmental conditions like rain, weather conditions, storms, and a protectance against that. And it gives us all the utilities we need, electricity, uh, water, um, such, such things. And the only thing that we can do is we can move freely in this structure and just wherever we want to stop, we can take advantage of the superstructure and live there. And this can even uh, mean that there's an emergence of an entire new lifestyle where people use this urban web to move and to uh, constantly travel along the urban web. And so if they choose not to, to remain at one permanent space, they can. And it could mean that there is an entire new uh, range of vehicles that could be designed. Uh, Many of them already uh, exist. Think about the many cool vans that are used for people when they go to uh, music festivals and, and stuff like that, or when they go on a journey. journey. Uh, think about the tiny house movements. Uh, but they could be used within a superstructure as well. Uh, so that's another conceptual idea about uh, dealing with space and dealing, dealing with structures that stops uh, from the moment when you think pure from an individualistic perspective and when you start to think more collectively as a, uh, one human species and how a structure could serve us. Um, and that, those are all illustrations that show that. One, the other one shows more tiny houses that are placed somewhere and that are used by a group of people who wants to use a part of the superstructure to live. Uh, this, that transit uh, linear city could be used uh, to attract people from villages, to give them the opportunity to use, to use it as well. Because, of course, we will not force people uh, to abandon their village as well. Uh, what you see here is yet yeah, another example that I once designed of um, an electri electrified uh, bicycle uh, that uses some sort of open uh, source uh, materials that can be really modularly rearranged to create some cool uh, bicycle that you can use as a house. So this is more difficult in the winter to use, but if you have the protection of a, a superstructure, you could easily do that as well. And if you have very nearby the possibility to grow food and, 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 uh, and stuff like that, you could uh, live a quite self-sufficient, uh, self-aligned lifestyle. And this is uh, another example that I once uh, made where you could easily uh, have a much more resilient way of looking at things, adapt, adaption and flexibility that will be needed in an, in an ever-changing world that where the changes that to come uh, with climate change are, uh, w which will be uh, necessary. Um, and here you see how uh, the linear city grows and how uh, old infrastructure is demolished and used to build the new city. So you see people here, you could actually have a tribe of people, could be solar punks, who feel attracted to a lifestyle where, where they help to regenerate the surrounding world and where, where they help to plant and uh, rewild uh, barren land and help to uh, uh, recover our world. And um, this is what you see here, people deconstructing freestanding houses and abandoned infrastructure and people that are uh, obviously growing uh, plants. What you see underneath is the same, but with uh, trucks that are um, adapted so they can use the railway infrastructure and they are uh, electrified here. And they 
uh, within the trucks and when, within the cargo trailers there are there is there are open source machinery that can be used to demolish larger uh, infrastructures that can be again used recycled uh, to build new structures and you see how the city could uh, yeah, grow um, yeah. okay again back Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the battery is low. <laughs> uh, so we we still have some time to um, to uh, to finish the entire presentation and to talk a little bit about eco villages as well. So eco villages, because the the vision that I portrayed here is obviously all urban and it makes sense if we want to do huge scale uh, rewilding efforts and if we want to live as efficiently as possible. But there will still be. Um, plenty of uh, isolated villages as well and we will not get rid of all the infrastructure from one day to another and there will be people with uh, other beliefs as well but our villages as well could also uh, change and become more resilient more adapted uh, to uh, the changes to come and what you see here is actually um, an illustration that's derived from a real existing uh, housing solutions called Pirapot from an American inventor who uses uh, some sort of technology which he calls solar roof technology. It's, uh, it uses a, a, a layer of finishing with a, some sort of bubbly foam that is used to thermoregulate the entire house, which means in the winter, uh, because of this foam that's inside it, it can uh, heat up uh, the place and in the, in the summer, it keeps the, the, the place uh, cold. If you want to know more about it technologically, he has an entire website where he explains those things and he made many uh, designs. It's a combination of uh, a traditional house with this new technology as well. So, we, because what you see a lot is that there will be, especially in more isolationist uh, communities, less opportunities uh, to make use of um, yeah, uh, uh, an enormous supply network of new materials. So you should be um, think very cleverly how you uh, shape and, and, and construct things. So this is a rather simple design, but what you see is the traditional Acadian uh, house, uh, so Acadian settlers from the northern part of Canada. And what you see there is a, a, a traditional oven. So you see some low-tech, being mixed with a more uh, more high-tech new technology, a basement used to, to, to store food, and again uh, this modeler approach, you could easily make uh, it a, a larger building as well, a simple design. Um, and there are plenty of other designs that are equally interesting to uh, to study or to look at, and the rooftop being used here as a garden, as an uh, it's actually technology that is often used for greenhouses as well. And you see that there are part, some parts, like the lower level, is finished with traditional materials. It can be uh, tra traditional locally organic materials like mud, clay, stuff like that, adobe. Um, and uh, energy production, that is what you see in this very commercialized, commodified world, is that people are, are again forced to, surf, uh, to solve all the problems on an individual level. But like things like energy would be much more logical if we do it on a cooperative community level. Uh, so that's what you see here is that on a community level people use uh, the community to uh, give them energy security with power stations. And again you see the, the typical permaculture uh, uh, elements uh, coming back. Yeah, um, the eco-villages, they can have different roles. Uh, and they can be integrated in, in a, um, a broader vision as well. One of those uh, at the right uh, is some sort of meditation center that you see it's still connected with uh, the linear or contour, contour city. But again, uh, um, at, at its borders, we keep that reserved for nature. Uh, so that's something that comes back also with eco-villages. And this is, uh, again, more, more Eastern inspired and perhaps some of the spiritual communities uh, could reside there and give us courses and teach us the, 
the interesting life lessons um, and uh, other eco villages that are completely immersed by nature could be um, part of a new new schools with, within a new solar punk civilization what will also uh, uh, arise is new schools now our educational system is very focused on what the corporations and what our current society needs and what, what sort of skills it needs but perhaps in the future we will focus more on regenerative practices about rewilding about craftsmanship a lot of people completely don't know how the things that they wear the things that they eat the things that they have how they are produced which makes them very vulnerable and yet many people um, find pleasure in crafting some things themselves so it could become uh, they could become new schools where they teach people again to have uh, crafts and to have to, to have um, skills so they can devise and create and become makers themselves as well and so this is what you see at the, li at the, at the left one of those eco villages that's completely focusing on nature rewilding regenerating our um, second world and uh, finally and i think this is uh, almost the last slide i uh, actually assume that it's it's last slide um uh, is perhaps even uh, a lifestyle in dense forests would be possible for some if we um if we uh think about what what, what could be um possible here you see uh, subterranean houses that at the right you have halfly sub, uh, subterranean and where it's there's an entire vision of subterranean houses as well and subterranean infrastructure and it has advantages because there's um, it can much more easily blend in with nature and there's uh, perhaps less uh, impact on uh, the surroundings as well so in a forest it could be uh, easily, that, easily done that we create structures that can be integrated in the forest or in more natural landscapes like you see here and perhaps communities and people could live uh, in, in such places. It doesn't mean that there will, that will be entirely low-tech. It could be that there are people uh, who still use high-tech uh, as well, like those cabins are actually pots, very small, very simplistic lifestyle, but yet they could have computers, telecom uh, applications, and they could be in touch with the entire complex world and s yet still live in, uh, in, in the middle of the, the wilderness, but still being connected with uh, the outer world for many services that they need. Because surviving in the wilderness, that's very hard to do. You still would need community, you will still need uh, contact with other people and underneath you see a uh, um, uh, hanging structures so that's another possibility if we uh, make materials that don't um, hurt the trees that much uh, we could create nice uh, tree house designs as well so i think this is yeah, the last slide so um, um, i um, managed to give you a view of, of all the different visions so I'm glad that I could uh, keep in time and um, what you see here is a last illustration again of a, a, a water um, a water system with this is something that I didn't uh, talk about about living on on waters there wasn't enough room but this is a small glimpse of it where they use again some sort of superstructure uh, that's standing on a, what we call PSP platform as a self uh, stabilizing platform that can be used to stack different volumes and where people could adapt and uh, uh, create the volumes uh, as they as they wish and uh, you see also that the it blends with the traditional stilt houses that you would see in a, a more aquatic environment um, something that I for, uh, forgot to mention as well we will need the knowledge of indigenous people native people something that we uh, neglected um, in the colonial age we um, completely uh, 
abandoned um, and suppressed uh, that type of knowledge, but native people who nurtured the land and used the land for so many ages have a lot of knowledge about uh, what in that particular bioregion uh, would be the, the best solution. So uh, I would welcome it if, if that could blend in with uh, the solar pink visions as well. And what you see is obviously also the, the new public transport that uh, emerges everywhere. So uh, I would say thank you for uh, your attention. I hope uh, you, yeah, that it gave you an idea what, what solar punk might be um, from the viewpoint of one artist. And I assume that many artists, because it's a, a collective approach, have other visions that are equally interesting. Uh, and together, I hope we could go towards a brighter future. So thank you for your attention. If there are still some questions, I don't know, yeah. yeah. Good. good, good, okay. Thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, it's amazing uh, work. Uh, question about um, whether do you um, collaborate with architects? Like to realize some of these ideas and, and you know in your drawings I, I think of architects like for instance terraform one Michahim or um, Francois Roche from France they work with you know natural and ecosystem uh, processes in your in their work for instance uh, no I didn't work with architects and or any real life uh, project the, the people that we, which I collaborate the most are uh, often other artists or science fiction writers who um, do some storytelling, create the narratives, and that's the terrain where I have most experience in. But it would be interesting in the future to uh, to look if some of those designs could be realized or to collaborate with such people. Okay, thanks for the presentation. I Thank definitely you. would love to live in such an organic city. That's a great uh, vision. But it hits me several times when I was looking at those uh, pictures you presented that these structures are extremely freshwater hungry. And uh, so my question would be if uh, we would like to build such an organic city in the area where the freshwater is scarce, how it should look like, what, how it should change to actually respect that we do not have enough fresh water in such an area. Oh, so your question is what we what we should do in, in a desert-like region? Yeah, yeah. How, how the, such an organic city should look like in a desert-like region? Well, yeah. Actually, um, it will definitely be um, and then a geographical. The position that you're at, you're at will differ, and and like you. Uh, uh, saw many of the cities are more central Europe, so I try to um, focus on the place where I live, because I'm less familiar with what happens in northern Africa or in the middle of Africa or in the jungle era. And um, I'm, I'm glad to see that there is a, within the solar punk movement, there's a much more empowerment of other artists who live in other regions to give them uh, the, the empowerment because they know their, uh, what, what materials can be used there, what's uh, possible over there and how this, perhaps some of these visions can be integrated in their region. I have uh, made some designs about more uh, cities that are in, 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 a, in a desert region where we um, I, I, I can show them to you, but uh, I could uh, share them with you later on, where they use uh, more, uh, more structures that are subterranean. So where they go subterranean, because it's very difficult over there, like you say, because there are very harsh and difficult conditions. And some places uh, I expect will be just uninhabitable in the future as well. It will be very difficult to, uh, to, to remain there. So it could be that some places uh, that become too hot to live will be um, yeah, unpopulated and that people will move much more towards Nordic parts where it's more uh, easier po possible to live. And what I've also seen is that there are large, um, but it's at the borders of where the desert starts, large uh, efforts to 
undo this, this, the certification and where they tried to create green walls. And I actually saw a vision of a befriended solar punk uh, futurist writer that uh, devised the concept of the linear city at the borders where there is still some green, where there is more captivity of water, but in the middle of a desert, I think that will be uh, difficult. Yeah, thank you. A question about uh, self-sustainability and using services for everything. Like, uh, for example, here, in our picture, there are wind turbines. Like, do people service them by themselves, or everything uh, for everything you use some kind of service? So, uh, people do it on an individual scale. Is that your question, or do they on an individual community or community? Yeah. Well, it, it, when the, the most visions that I worked on, it's more on a community level. So, uh, because it's again, it's very difficult to. Um, to manage a self-sufficient lifestyle on your own, it's actually even dif difficult in a, a small group of people. Like say, if we combine, we want to have a self-sustainable uh, lifestyle, it would be difficult. So for many things, you absolutely will rely on a larger network. I'm even talking about for some means of production or for some utilities, you will uh, need a regional cooperatives. So that's something that will need to be established. Uh, and that's something that makes it very difficult today because we live in a hyper-individualized society where the communities that exist aren't well equipped enough uh, to organize, organize such uh, civilization. But we should evolve towards uh, those regional networks of cooperatives um, to serve all our, our means. I think it will be very difficult to live a very self-sustainable lifestyle on your on your own. Yeah, so in case where my house shrinks to the size of the pot, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I rely on a community yes. Yes. rather than external services. Yeah, you, 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 you will still uh, partly rely on, on, on the community as well. So uh, it will not be somewhere in the remote jungle where you could survive on your own. That's difficult. One more question from, from myself. Thank you so much for the, uh, for the presentation. You're welcome. I see definitely the value of the project. Um, a question, what, is a, what are the costs of the project? And do you receive any investments or, or not? Well, if you would look at it from a, the financial perspective from our present day, uh, uh, way how we look at finances, then it's very costly to make this. But this is something like you see seen in the transition that evolves over time, where we will also introduce different economic models as well, uh, based on reciprocity, based on um, perhaps new tokens that can be introduced, uh, based on um, social, um, uh, like your, your social input that you give uh, for a community. Uh, so um, uh, things like that, so we will evolve away from the monetary civilization that we have now and uh, the moment that we can establish this new community identity we could uh, also reintroduce uh, different means to um, different different models that the, for the final system that we know today to organize uh, more complex uh, things cool thank you So th those were the questions, right on time.